I am Sun Ra, ambassador from the intergalactic regions of the Council of Outer Space. Herman Poole Blount, later known as Sun Ra, was an American jazz composer, piano, synth player, and overall bad shit crazy person. In addition to being a brilliant jazz player, he was a philosopher, poet, author, futurist, black rights activist, self-proclaimed angel, and extraterrestrial being. About those last points, yes, it's true, the man literally thought he came from Saturn. Throughout his life, he garnered a cult following, but never managed to break into mainstream music culture, forever living on as a musician's musician, inspiring countless other artists and bands such as Sonic Youth, Flying Lotus, and MF Doom, just to mention a few. On the surface, he seems like a weirdo, but these people care about him, ergo, there's more to him than what meets the eye and the ears. In this video, we'll explore the life and times of Sun Ra. This is the message beyond the music. The music is different here. The vibrations are different. It's not like Planet Earth. Sun Ra was born Herman Poole Blount on May 22nd, 1914 in Birmingham, Alabama. His mother named him after Black Herman, a popular vaudeville stage magician who made a strong impression on her. The coincidence here is that Herman would grow up to be a powerful stage performer himself. As a child, he showcased a keen ear and talent for music. Already by the age of 11, he was a skilled pianist, composed his own music, and could even sight-read music, which means that he could read a piece of music he'd never seen before and play it on the piano in real time, fluently. But according to his peers, he possessed an even greater ability. He was able to transcribe the music that other bands performed on the fly in his mind. Herman was nothing less than an outstanding musician with prodigious talents. Unfortunately, he needed a lot more than talent to make a living off of his music. He needed connections and a fair bit of luck. In the late 20s and early 30s, racial inequality and segregation made a big impact on the daily lives of US citizens. Something that might have contributed to Herman's tendencies of isolation and his troubles finding people that could help him move forward with his career. Instead, he became a ferocious reader, often spending hours in the Black Masonic Lodge in Birmingham studying collections of Freemasonry and various esoteric scriptures. But the pressure from society was only one of several troubles in his life. Sometime during his teens, he was diagnosed with cryptorchidism, a physical disorder in which one or both of the testes are absent from the scrotum. This left him with constant discomfort and sometimes severe pain. But he wouldn't let his physical illness or his introversion stand in the way of his musicianship. He got his first full-time musical job in 1934 when he played in a band with his high school biology teacher, Ethel Harper. She had put together a touring band to start her own career as a singer. Sadly, the band wasn't financially sustainable and they disbanded shortly after. But persistent in his wish to pursue music as a career, he decided to study music instead. Unfortunately, that didn't go as planned either, as he dropped out after the first year. He definitely had a good reason for it though. Or maybe I should say a good cover-up story. We'll get back to that later though. Another place in the universe, up under different stars. That would be where the altar destiny would come in. Herman moved to Chicago in 1945, a city where he'd lived for the next 16 years. The 30-odd-year-old Herman first found jobs in local strip clubs playing bump and grind music. He then formed new groups with local musicians and found new inspiration in the city's rich religious culture. Religion had always been a big pillar of Herman's upbringing, but here he was introduced to a lot of new viewpoints. The Egyptian-inspired architecture in Chicago made a big impact on him too, leading him to model his creative output with ancient Egyptian art and history in mind. But it wasn't just his environment and creative output that changed during this time. Herman decided to rewrite his entire identity and history. Remember when I said he had a good reason or cover-up story for dropping out of university? 
Well, when people asked him what he did during his college years, he told them a story of how he was abducted by an alien species. The aliens told him about the societal disorder that was about to come, the Second World War, and that his role in this was to play music and save the human race. In several interviews, Herman referred to himself as an angel. And in 1952, he changed his name to Sun Ra, inspired by the Egyptian sun god of the same name. Eccentric, comedic, or simply crazy, no matter how you choose to interpret his personality, most fans agree that he produced some very influential and innovative music. The Chicago phase of his career is often cited as the most critically acclaimed one and the most accessible to new listeners. Ra moved on from playing big band swing to the outer space themed cosmic jazz that most people know him for. Many fans would point to Jazz and Silhouette as the go-to album from this era, an often overlooked masterpiece according to some that is relatively conventional in its approach to jazz. Now, it was in Chicago that his band, the orchestra, became more consistent in their performances and recordings as well. He met people that became long-term members and contributors to his band, such as John Gilmore, Marshall Allen, and Alton Abraham. You got all kinds of things happening on this planet. All these walls, all this destruction. And that doesn't seem right for intelligent people. It doesn't seem even right for righteous people, you know. In the fall of 61, Sun Ra and the members of the orchestra moved to New York. The idea was to play a few gigs there, do some studio sessions, and then head back to Chicago. But as soon as they crossed George Washington Bridge, they collided with a taxi and bent one of the wheels of their car. With no money for repairs, they were stranded. And that's how Sun Ra and many of the band members at the time ended up settling in New York. A short trip turned into a nomadic adventure. While living there, they recorded another one of Sun Ra's most accessible records, The Futuristic Sounds of Sun Ra, in 62. Unfortunately, like so many of his other albums, it fell into obscurity because of close to no publicity and poor distribution. Poor sales and distribution was a curse that followed the band for a long time, but luckily things were about to get better. From 66 and onwards, they secured regular gigs at Slug Saloon. This was an early peak in Sun Ra's popularity, as his music was embraced by the early psychedelic movement. His music became way more avant-garde inspired and experimental during this time, and the beatniks and hippies loved it. Although their support helped, it wasn't enough to cover all their expenses, and so they left their New York fences. I don't remember ever having been there, but I'm sure I'm a citizen of Saturn. But I have been to Jupiter, so a lot of people have done things that they're afraid to speak of, you see. The band relocated to the Germantown area of Philadelphia, a place that became the orchestra's headquarter until Sun Ra's death. Now, during the late 60s and 70s, their music returned back to more conventional forms, while their stage show evolved into something bigger and more dynamic. Back when the orchestra made their first tour on the West Coast in 68, the reception of their music was mixed, but most people were impressed with their performances. Dancers, fire breathers, and elaborate Egyptian-inspired costumes made it impossible to ignore them. In April of 69, Sun Ra was even featured on the cover of Rolling Stone magazine. This obviously helped him quite a bit in selling records and building an audience something that kept them going throughout the next decades up until today. Yes, the Sun Ra Orchestra still performs in present times, unfortunately without Sun Ra. In 1990, he had a stroke, but kept on performing, composing and leading the orchestra just like he always did. He even opened for Sonic Youth when they started getting successful in the 90s. Sun Ra's health only worsened with time though, and so he would get help from his fellow band members John Gilmore and Marshall Allen to lead the band when he couldn't perform. 
In late 92, he moved back to his hometown, Birmingham, to live with his cousins and older sister. He was later admitted to Princeton Baptist Medical Center since he suffered from congestive heart failure, respiratory failure, strokes, and other serious maladies. Now, the orchestra still performs to this day under the lead of Marshall Allen, with the most recent live performance video on YouTube dating back to April 28th, 2019. So if you want to watch some of the recent live performances, it's very, very easy to find. Now, there's so much more I could talk about in regards to Sun Ra and his music. He made his own film, had numerous scriptures of poetry, philosophy, and recording methods. He was a spokesperson for black culture. And last but not least, his music inspired so many modern rock, R&B, and hip hop artists. We could literally go on forever, but I'll leave you with this. He was one of the most committed musicians ever to walk this planet and Saturn, allegedly. He went beyond physical illness, racial segregation, lack of money, and lack of recognition in order to live the life he wanted, a life filled with music. He was way more innovative than most other musicians in his time too. In the 60s and 70s, he was one of the first people to use synthesizers, and specifically the Moog synthesizer. He was one of the first to create immersive live shows and to create his independent record label. He created scenes, album covers, and posters in this DIY fashion that wouldn't come around until the mid-70s and 80s with punk and hardcore music. So innovation, commitment and innovation are the core messages behind his music. Or what do you say, Sun Ra? Yeah, that is the message in uh, all of my music. It's all about uh, people doing something else other than what they have done. So that's it, I've created a list of some of the best entry-level Sun Ra albums down in the description if you want to have a listen. If you like this video, please consider checking out my merch. I've created merch specifically for this video, inspired by the artwork that I also made. So consider checking that out if you're a fan of the channel. Also, if you want to make videos like this and you want to learn how to do that for yourself, also click the link below to check out my other channel where I am going to upload more tutorials on how to do this. So that's it. Thank you so much for watching. Beyond.